All right, so we've covered kind of this brief history of anthropology as a whole and, and really talked about its roots in um, colonialist origins. Um, now we're going to talk briefly about the four subfields of anthropology. Now, if you take Anthro 1115, you'll get this broad kind of overview of all four subfields and you'll spend part of the term covering each one individually. But anthropology and its strength is really in the various methods um, and frameworks that each of these subfields offers. So if we want to get a complete understanding of a particular behavior, a particular cultural feature, the best way to understand it is to understand each of its component parts and, and its evolutionary history and how uh, the practice looked different in the past, etc. So we, of course, are starting with cultural anthropology because that's what this course is, Introduction to Cultural Anthropology. But that's only one part of anthropology. Uh, we also have archaeological anthropology or archaeology. This looks at material remains, looks at cultures of the past, oftentimes before writing was ever developed. Has some strong overlap with cultural anthropology because we expect that modern cultures have their roots in the cultures that came before them. We also have biological anthropology, uh, which is looking at the biological basis for humanity. And so this goes back in a farther time depth than archaeology does. Archaeology may go back between about 10,000 and 100,000 years. Biological anthropology goes back millions of years, looks at even fossil hominids, but can also, of course, look at modern populations. And then lastly, we have linguistic anthropology. And so in general, uh, if you end up transferring ever into a four-year institution um, in, and you pursue anthropology, you'll find a four-subfield approach. Um, in Europe, um, the, the, it's a three-subfield approach, cultural anthropology, biological, and linguistics. Archaeology is often in its own department. And so like if you watch the... Indiana Jones movies, they talk about him being in the department of like antiquities, right? Archaeology and antiquities. Um, in some places like UNM, um, we don't have a separate linguistic anthropology program anymore. That was uh, been kind of assumed under cultural anthropology. So we functionally, even though there are courses in linguistics, we functionally have a three subfield department. So just be aware of this as you go on with the rest of your life, whether you decide to take more anthropology or not, right? These subfields are not at odds with one another, though oftentimes kind of politically uh, in terms of funding and uh, esteem and such, there can be some animosity between the subfields. That's not necessary. It doesn't have to happen. And the true anthropology lies, let's see if I can get my cursor to work, lies right here in the middle, right? This is what anthropology as a discipline should be uh, worried about. All right, so cultural anthropology focuses on the social lives of living communities. Prior to the 1970s, the main focus was on non-Western communities, particularly, uh, I made that comment in the first part of this lecture, um, non-literate or even pre-literate um, pre uh, non-state level societies. So looking at smaller groups, looking at tribal populations, looking at hunter gatherers, looking at um, peoples where most of their social, social structure is based on kinship um, versus uh, perhaps economics as we might say that Western culture is. Today, cultural anthropologists study the ethnic groups, occupations, institutions, advertising, technology of their own cultures as well, um, really bringing in what may be viewed as a cross-cultural perspective. There used to be a dichotomy between um, pre-1970s anthropology and uh, sociology, where studies of modern Western populations were limited to sociology. That is not the case anymore. Uh, there's a lot of overlap between anthropology and sociology. And really then it comes down to um, kind of the discipline that you studied as a professional before you started your career and, and the main kind of theoretical uh, underpinnings of your research methodology. So um, in a lot of places, there's a social a human social science kind of department, right? That sociology and anthropology can even be um, assumed under the same department heading. Archaeology studies past cultures by excavating the sites where people lived. Um, in 
prehistoric archaeology, we're looking at a vast time period before written records ever emerged. Writing emerged about 6,000 years ago in the form of pictographs or cuneiform, where you often had a clay tablet and you would press sticks in it to make impressions and then dry the clay, um, and that would be your, your written record. Um, it, pictograph meaning that these were not like a script kind of thing, right? They were images uh, more than <clears throat> even just simply an alphabet. Um, and writing didn't emerge until full state level societies emerged. So if we talk about pre-state versus state level societies, uh, state level societies, whether they're archeological states or whether they're modern states have sought to erase some of the kinship ties between the people in their group to uh, create artificial social stratification, maybe based on socioeconomics, maybe based on um, occupational specialization, etc. cetera. Um, but really that social structure where you've got elites um, and commoners, the 99%, the 1%, et cetera, uh, in stark contrast to one another. Um, that's not how most of human history has been most of human history. We've been in smaller face-to-face -face societies where most of our social obligations are mediated by kinship. So it shouldn't surprise us that family is still so important to humans. All right, so some of the major changes that came throughout prehistory included uh, the advent of agriculture. Um, the advent of agriculture is a big topic studied by archaeologists has started somewhere around 12,000 years ago with the retreat of the last glacial um, and was necessary for increasing human population numbers to be able to sustain themselves because the climate was changing. We didn't have things like mastodons to eat anymore. We had hunted them to extinction. Their ranges had been restricted because the glaciers were retreating. We had to come up with new ways of feeding ourselves. Um, also, another important change of prehistory is this rise of complex cities and states. And so really seeing a change in um, political structure that maps on to this change in diet. There's also a sub field of archaeology called historical archaeology. And this is archaeology of populations after writing had already emerged. And so uh, historical archaeologists are able to make use of written records as well as uh, their own observations and the material remains. That's, that's a buzzword that's not on this slide. But the big thing about archaeology is that you're studying what we call material remains, tools, patterns of settlement, um, basically garbage, right? The things that people discard. We're studying their life ways through uh, their discarded uh, materials. Um, and so these excavations are able to then explore perspectives that aren't recorded in historical documents. So I grew up in Virginia. Virginia was very proud of being one of the 13 original colonies of the United States. Um, Virginia was also the birthplace of several of the first presidents, um, including Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, homestead was called Monticello, and that was only like 45 minutes from where I grew up. So one of our major uh, field trips in elementary school was to go tour Monticello, right? We had people come in from out of state or out of the country. We'd go places like Colonial Williamsburg and Monticello. Um, I think that we went I don't know, at least like three times in elementary school. It was kind of like how Los Ranchos de los Colandrinas is for students in the Albuquerque area, right? Uh, it's your historical kind of perspective on what life used to be like in, in your immediate area. And so Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. There's no way to, I mean, there's no point in justifying that from a, a kind of social context right he was good to his slaves he cared about his slaves etc none of that matters he he was a slave owner and and it was part of uh the colony in which he lived right and part of the cultural practices of the country in which he lived um but he had a particular favorite um that he spelt uh that he felt a special affinity for sally um, Hemingsworth. And so um, there's been some re recent archaeology that has really um, indicated just how special Sally was in, in uh, Thomas Jefferson's life. Um, she even had, uh, in addition to her slave quarters, she even had a room off of Jefferson's bedroom. And, and this was a room in Monticello that 
people didn't know was there. Like they had to pull walls down and such to uh, be able to find uh, the room where Sally was kept really close to Thomas Jefferson. So, you know, there's stuff to be gained uh, from studying what you see, not just what is recorded about in history. There's really a lot left to understanding like day-to-day -day daily life, um, things that wouldn't be uh, worthy of note in historical documents. Your assignment for this week is going to be um, basically writing your observations of your own life as if you were a newcomer to that um, and keeping track of everything you do. And, and there are a lot of things that wouldn't be worthy of writing down, right? Ate lunch. Um, that may not seem like something that uh, it's necessary to record the details of, but what if you've never seen something like a sandwich before, right? What if you come from a population that doesn't have bread? Then suddenly the idea that the foundation of your sandwich can come from a plastic bag that has a twisty around it seems worthy of observation, seems worthy of noting. So you'll kind of have to do something similar as you uh, engage in this weekly assignment. Biological anthropology is our third subfield. It can also be called physical anthropology or evolutionary anthropology. At UNM, it's called evolutionary anthropology. If you take um, Anthropology 1135 here at CNM, it's also called Introduction to Evolutionary Anthropology. I do uh, sometimes teach this class if you ever wanna decide you wanna take it with me. Um, this focuses on the biological aspects of the human species. This can be past and present. So there is a field under biological anthropology that's called paleoanthropology that is looking at uh, these fossil hominins, looking at earlier versions of what we were before we were fully human. It also uh, is tasked with studying those of our closest relatives, the non-human primates. And so my own specialization with primatology uh, comes under the umbrella of evolutionary anthropology. So some of the topics that are, uh, have come out of this subfield include human evolution, studies of health and disease, there are a number of people who have anthropological training that go on and get like masters in public health. Epidemiology, for example, has some of its root not only in the medical sciences, but in anthropology as well. Uh, human genetics, we've got some top-notch geneticists at UNM who are studying migration, studying things like mitochondrial DNA, studying um, so both modern genetic traits and also um, prehistories of people. Diet and nutrition. Um, you know, we recognize that we have something called the USRDA, the recommended daily allowance of various um, vitamins and minerals. Um, well, we, we already notice in the US there's a difference between breastfed and formula fed babies and the way that their growth patterns are. When we look at um, indigenous populations where there's food scarcity, guess what? Their babies aren't even on our growth charts. Uh, their growth is so slow. So seeing this degree of biological variability that ties into uh, diet and nutrition. Looking at the impact of social stress on the body, there's a primatologist by the name of Robert Sapolsky who looked worked with baboons and wrote this phenomenal book called A Primate's Memoir, but he also wrote a book about why zebras don't get stressed out right? We have uh, distinct physiological responses of stress. Um, and that's not just like someone chasing after you, trying to kill you, right? Um, there is an association with different stress levels and then different lifetime outcomes, health and otherwise, that is associated with the socioeconomic status of your mother while you're growing up. So growing up in poverty is a big stressor. This is really really important in the world of education because uh, we're becoming more aware of trauma um, induced you know, behavioral problems in children. Uh, and as you look at like the basic needs that have to be filled, right? If you're hungry and you're worried about being abused or neglected or you know, your own safety, um, you're not gonna be able to sit down and learn to read, right? We've got to recognize how trauma informs our educational practices uh, and how traumas are processed by, uh, by the students that we work with. And then the behaviors of non-human primates. Um, there's a lot to learn from non-human primates, um, particularly when we look at those that are terrestrial, they live on the ground like baboons and chimpanzees, uh, and also those that are most closely related to us like chimp chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas that 
Um, Non-human primates show a lot of the features that we do. Did you know, for example, here we've got an orangutan mom with her baby. They nurse for five to seven years. Those babies are nursing from mom. Well, guess what? If we look at human populations that we call quote unquote natural fertility populations, that is, they're not using birth control. They're um, ages of weaning. Uh, they don't have access to formula. Their ages of weaning influence uh, their subsequent pregnancies. Uh, it's got this biological basis of mediating fertility. Um, the average age of weaning across human populations is around the age of four. So we have a long-standing primate heritage of nursing our babies for a very long time. I guarantee for many of you, you know, check your own biases right here. If you saw a woman sitting at Target nursing a four-year-old, what would you think? Most of us would judge that, right? We'd be like, oh, that's ridiculous. That baby can walk and talk. Why does that baby still need breast milk? Or you know, they're not even a baby, right? Um, without recognizing that historically, evolutionarily, uh, we nursed our babies for much longer than the average of six months that uh, humans do in America today. And then linguistic anthropology. Linguistic anthropology studies how people communicate through language. Language is a hallmark of humanity. Um, we don't only communicate through language, right? But we use language to shape our group membership and our identity. Part of how you think about yourself is based on um, the language that you speak and, and the kind of grammar and structure that are present in that language. We also study language to understand how people order their natural and cultural environments using linguistic categories. So one example, uh, there are some historical linguistic anthropologists that are relatively famous, one of those being Noam Chomsky. Um, Noam Chomsky had this idea that humans have universal grammar, that all languages are, are seemingly universally structured. He had some, uh, some linguists who disagreed with them, like Sapir and Worf, who developed uh, what they call the Sapir-Worf hypothesis, that our culture shapes our lang uh, that language and culture are intimately interrelated and that language will restrict cultural thought. And so one example that's used um, to both support and negate this idea is uh, the language of the Hopi. The Hopi have two verb tenses in their language. They have that which has occurred or is occurring. So present and past are, um, are gathered up under one tense in their language. And then they have a language tense for that which has not yet occurred. So future is separate. Um, according to like a strict application of the superior wharf hypothesis, they would say that people of a Hopi ancestry don't distinguish past and present. But absolutely they do, just because they don't have a verb tense that expresses that doesn't mean that it's not um, kind of a level of complex thought that they're not capable of. So you know, we structure our world according to our language, but we also change our language incredibly rapidly, right? If I had given you a phrase a year ago, COVID-19, that would have had no meaning to you whatsoever. Um, we rapidly change our uh, our language to accommodate cultural changes, right? I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to mute people in your daily life um, like you can do in something like a Zoom call, right? Um, put them on mute or, you know, hold up your hands and be like socially distanced, right? Um, there are going to be things from quarantine that are going to carry over to uh, our lives in the future that you know, we'll really be able to pinpoint. We, we've, we're living through history, right? We'll be able to pinpoint, tell our kids, our grandkids, our great grandkids about, you know, the big epidemic of 2020. All right, so at its core, anthropology is an interdisciplinary field. There are some closely related things that we need to express that come from this center point of anthropology, right? This overlap between the four of the subfields. All four subfields look at culture. All four subfields take a stance of cultural relativism. Um, we look at diversity across the subfields. We look at change across the subfields. And we look at something called holism across the subfield. So we're gonna talk about each of these in a little greater detail. In anthropology, the term culture refers to the notions that we take for granted. These are things like rules, moralities, behaviors within a social group 
that feel natural and feel like the way things should be. Some definitions of culture define culture as anything that is not not culture, um, which is really a poor way to uh, to define a word. We'll talk about definitions of culture more with lecture two. Um, but culture is an integral part of humanity, and thusly culture has been an integral part of anthropology since the beginning. So even uh, evolutionary anthropologists who are looking at the biological basis for human behavior um, still look at this role of human culture. Um, this term was first applied in the 1870s by a British anthropologist who's pictured over here on the right, um, Edward Burnett Tyler. Uh, cultural relativism. We have a human tendency to view the world in an ethnocentric way, to apply ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is where we judge the value of another culture based on the standards of our own. So we compare everything to what we're already familiar with. To avoid that, Anthropologists emphasize cultural relativism or this moral and intellectual principle that one should withhold judgment about seemingly strange or exotic beliefs and practices. Um, over the winter break, I started reading a fantastic book um, that has a very riveting title. It's just called A Natural History of Cannibalism, right? Cannibalism is one of those things that we're kind of obsessed with. Uh, you know, the, the taboo kind of thing that you shouldn't eat your other group members, right? And so we've got to understand how it happens in other species to really understand how it's happened in human groups. Um, some of the other uh, things, I mean, incest, right? We're not supposed to marry our relatives. There's a good biological reason for that. However, uh, European nobility um, throughout, from you know, like the 1100s all the way up to the 1900s, uh, they practice cross cousin marriage where they were marrying their first cousins. And because of that, there were a lot of uh, recessive genetic disorders like hemophilia, colorblindness. Uh, they were called quote unquote blue bloods because their blood literally had a bluish tint to it um, because of a, a mutation in the hemoglobin uh, that is present in red blood cells. So, you know, we have these kind of taboo or exotic behaviors that we become obsessed with that we want to understand. Um, but we need to, you know, there, there's a fine line that we have to walk here. We've got to be um, mindful of ethnocentrism because it provokes intolerance and can make it really, really hard to uh, understand the expression of a trait across cultures. I mean, right now we live in a, a a state of kind of xenophobia, fear of those who are different from us, and a lot of outward racism, you know, not simply the institutionalized racism that kind of is, uh, permeates all of our social institutions, but the increase in um, racist violence and discrimination against people of uh, Chinese descent in like, and actually not even just Chinese descent, anybody who looked quote unquote Asian, right? Um, in light of the global pandemic because of coronavirus first really being detected and studied in Wuhan, China. So we have to counter that. We have to, and, and you as a student, right? I mean, most of you are not going to be anthropologists. It's totally okay, right? Um, but what can anthropology offer you in terms of value? Well, I would challenge you to think that one of those things is to view the world from the viewpoint, uh, from this framework of cultural relativism, because you'll get a whole lot farther um, understanding other people's perspectives. And it's going to help for some of these social justice issues, for eradicating institutionalized racism against Blacks in the U.S., for uh, coming up with true gender equality, for um, global peace, right? All of these are going to be helped along by viewing the world from a culturally relativistic framework. Um, we do have to be careful though, because sometimes uh, applying cultural relativism at its most extreme can violate universal human rights. So we know that's another thing, that's another philosophical kind of debate. Is there some morality that reaches across national um, kind of politics and such so that we designate some atrocities, human rights violations, right? Like you should not be killed for your religion. You should not be killed for your gender. These happen widely in the world today still. Um, you know, so there are some things that 
though as anthropologists we're challenged to think of them without moral judgment maybe as humans we should judge some practices so we'll talk about for example female genital mutilation uh, clitoridectomy and infibulation as an expression of this Another of anthropology's major contributions to knowledge has been to describe and explain human diversity. We are a fascinating species. We look different, we act different, we talk different, we eat different foods, right? And there is a world of diversity in humanity um, that is amazing to experience. Um, the younger you are, often the more accepting you are of that diversity. It's really hard once you are like a, you know, someone in your 80s to be able to accept that other people do it in different ways. In anthropology, diversity doesn't mean minority or difference. Okay? What it means instead is multiplicity and variety. So diverse practices don't mean that they occur rarely and are uh, quantifiably very different from the status quo. Um, a lot of times diverse practices can seem very similar. Um, with multiplicity and variety, we get both similarities and differences rather than just focusing on the difference. So cannibalism, very, very different, right? Um, but the lunches that students bring to school, right? There's gonna be a lot of overlap. So um, I don't know if any of you have ever uh, were, were aware of the fact that um, Koreans eat a lot of sandwiches, but there's something fundamentally different about a Korean sandwich versus, you know, an American sandwich. It's not going to be like uh, roast beef, lettuce, tomato, and pickles. Well, it is kind of because the kimchi goes on their sandwiches. But, you know, the idea that we can take a food that is utilized across a wide variety of cultures and have it be, in essence, very similar, um, but also, in essence, very different, right? Um, that we can kind of take that spin on things. Food is a fantastic place to view this because we end up with restaurants that self-identify as something, something fusion, right? Like Asian American fusion or um, Italian American fusion, right? We, we end up with foods that meld, that marry these, uh, these different ethnic identities. And then change. As new topics, issues, and problems emerge, anthropology shift towards studying these new concerns. I guarantee that right now we've got a slew of people who are studying kind of cultural changes in response to the pandemic, right? Um, and this is going to be something that's going to be studied for the next 20, 30 years as we see cultural shifts that come in response to the economic kind of breakdown in this uh, pandemic world. Anthropology is increasingly practiced by everyone, including members of many minority groups and women. Um, anthropology actually, uh, particularly at four-year institutions and then particularly as you go on into graduate school, uh, is there's a skew towards women. Um, primatology is a good example of this. There are about 70% of primatologists are women, whereas only about 30% are men. So, you know, there are some disciplines that we have had a strong gender association with, right? Um, and anthropology has been one that people who traditionally have had less power have, been, have gravitated towards. Lastly, holism. Um, anthropology combines the study of the whole of humanity human prehistory, social life, language, biology in one broad discipline. This is the value of anthropology is that we're looking at the whole human experience in context. Um, so the tools that anthropology has to offer us are gonna carry you far. Um, anthropology as a discipline is not a lucrative money-making discipline, right? You're not gonna major in anthropology and expect to make a cool million by the time you're 30. It's simply not going to happen, right? Um, it's also not, a degree that is uh, super employable in the sense of there's not a big demand or competition out there for uh, companies to hire anthropologists. That being said, it is incredibly valuable to take anthropological practices and apply them to other uh, fields. Um, so there's a, a niche market for like corporate anthropologists studying corporate culture, corporate community, um, and what kind of changes uh, benefit basically the money-making potential of certain corporations. So um, there's a lot you can do with anthropological knowledge. All right, so 
here's where we'll take our break uh, for part two. Um, can you suggest ways that you may learn about the cultural identities of your peers, your students, et cetera? How can you then incorporate this information into how you interact with people with diverse cultural identities, right? There are some pretty major noticeable um, kind of social justice movements, for example. There's the phrase Black Lives Matter, right? And one, um, one thing that this relates to, there was a book that came out a couple of years ago called White Fragility. And the, and the people who seem to really fight against a movement like Black Lives Matter are particularly white men, right? Where you hear quips like all lives matter or quips like um, I don't see in color, right? I'm colorblind. I don't look at a person's color. Well, these are phrases that white people can use because of an inordinate amount of white privilege. And I'm white. I mean, there's no other way uh, to define it, right? Um, and I, I, as an anthropologist, I can recognize that that gives me a very different perspective, very different opportunities, very different um, kind of access to, um, to resources, to resources, to knowledge, to, to certain frameworks. So um, how can you incorporate the knowledge of someone else's really valuable lived experiences into how you interact with them, right? Because racism is strong in America. Um, you know, here in New Mexico, one of the things that blew me away when I first moved here in 97 was that there was racism among Hispanics. Back East in Virginia, Hispanic was an overarching term that meant anybody basically who spoke Spanish. Um, it still is used that way in kind of a pan Hispanic identity. Um, but when I got to Albuquerque, I noticed that there was particular racism between um, Mexican, people of Mexican uh, ancestry and people of, of Spain or Spanish ancestry. Um, and that totally threw me for a loop and surprised me, right? Um, we could say the same about pan Native American identity, right? We talk about Native Americans. Does that refer to one group? No, there were hundreds of different tribal affiliations and, and identities in pre-colonial North America. Um, and we've got to recognize that, that just by lumping people under a pan Native American identity, that doesn't mean they had shared experiences, right? Across the plains, you had the horsemen who uh, practiced bride capture and um, engaged in scalping of their enemies. Whereas, you know, here in the desert Southwest, we had uh, farmers among the Puebloans um, with very different kind of notions as to uh, what being a warrior meant. So we see, we've got to really understand the perspective of other people to be able to understand how they frame the world, how they frame their values, et cetera. 